Hey guys, welcome to Wednesday, Patreon Wednesdays. Uh, I've had a lot of requests uh, for my teaching on the archetypes, on uh, the five promises of male initiation, and then what, what are the, diff the four different archetypes of every man. Now, if you're a young woman, I want you to watch this. I walked my daughters through uh, this teaching about 15 years ago. I wanted them to learn what kind of man to look for. And if you're an older man, I want you to really press into this. Uh, you know, Paul says we have 10,000 teachers. We don't have many fathers. That fathers is masters. Men that have decided to step into a second half of life, leave success and all those things behind, everything that feeds the ego, and step into a space of serving others and making others better than us, making others great. And, uh, and that's what masters do. And so what a master or a king ultimately learns how to do is how to navigate all of the different archetypes and how to impart and initiate the next generation into stepping in to wanting to become a master. Now, let me make this really clear to you young people. You really don't know anything, number one, until you have children because you don't know how to sacrifice. Um, number two, uh, you really don't know anything until you're in your 60s, until you have some gray hair and some life, some deaths that have happened. Uh, just life in general teaches us uh, a lot that we can't learn any other way. <clears throat> so I'll tell you, 53, um, I, the older I get, the less I know. Um, I'm learning more now that uh, it's about the mystery and it's about the unknowns. Um, but this is one of my passions. My passion is to see the next generation initiated. And I'm pretty excited. At G42, the first time we've ever done this, 2020, April, uh, is uh, our initiation week for young men. We're going to take them out, Dave Hearn and some different people, and we're going to attempt uh, to, to cause some pain, but good pain, uh, because we can't be initiated, we can't step into the second half of life without some sort of suffering. When, um, when Paul got called, he was Saul, right? And he's walking down the road, he wasn't on a horse, by the way, and he gets knocked down, and he, he gets called out by God, and then it says, go find Paul, I must show him how much he must suffer for my namesake, Acts 9. And we don't like to talk about suffering, but suffering and pain truly are the greatest teachers. If we allow them to transform us, if we allow them to, to we sit in them and we hold them, we don't anesthetize them, we don't drink them away or push them down, but we, we learn to live through our heart and name the emotions that we're feeling. When I'm feeling sad now, I name that, you know what, I'm sad, my heart is sad. When I'm feeling excited, you know, my heart is excited. And, and so these male initiation rites are, are crucial. So there's a book, if you have not read it, and you want me to buy you a copy, just email me. I'll do it, Gary at theblacktribe.com. It is called Adam's Return, The Five Promises of Male Initiation uh, by a gentleman by the name of Richard Rohr, R-O-H-R. Now, I read Richard Rohr's daily devotionals. I don't recommend him, especially to new Christians. Um, I don't agree with a lot of what he teaches. Um, I think he's a bit of a universalist. But the things that he does nail, he nails. Uh, male initiation, um, first and second half of life. Uh, there's some things that he has studied and learned that uh, are mind-blowing, and his revelation is mind-blowing. Uh, and then there's other things that um, I, just, I just don't agree with. And I think we all need to learn how to chew on the meat and spit out the bones. And so uh, let me read this to you. The um, boys become men in much the same way across cultures by integrating through experience each of these five messages. So by integrating these five things through living life, through experiences and embracing, uh, this is how we learn those things. And so number one, life is hard. And there's an there's a antithesis to each one of these. When you read the book, Adam's Return, you'll learn that yes, life is hard, but God will always go into the pain with you and allow you to help you to transform that pain. If you don't transform your pain, you'll transmit it onto others in anger. It's just a given. And so we'll talk about the warrior archetype. Warriors left alone are very dangerous because they transmit their pain onto everyone around them. That's why we see military guys, 20, 30 a day committing suicide, because when you initiate only one side of the man, the warrior, and leave them in that space, it doesn't work. And so we'll get to that. So number one, life is hard. Number two, you are not that important. Let me tell you, some of the journeys I'm on, I'm going to do a six-week intensive on this on the heart. 
is that we're just ordinary and it's okay. You are not the best. You are not created to be the best. You're not going to save the world. You're not going to go be an NBA star or a you can't do anything that you want. The truth is, is that we're ordinary people. And as men, uh, we have to accept that. We have to accept that I, I can do nothing without Christ. I can do nothing that Jesus doesn't strengthen me for. And I need to learn to do things like wait on the Lord instead of pushing forward and doing it anyway. And so all of that comes through initiation, but none of us have ever learned that. So guess what? You're not that important. Number three is your life is not about you. Your life is not about you, but you are all about life. You understand that your life's not, it's not about you, but when you press into the stream of life, into the flow of the mystery, into the dance of the, the, the Tritarian dance, the Trinity dancing through you, then life comes out of you. You're always transmitting something. Something's always coming off of you, either your anger, your sadness, or your joy, or your strength, your positivity, your attitude determines lots of things around you. And so you're not that important. <clears throat> Uh, your life is not about you, but you are all about life. Number four, you are not in control. Now, I know many of you go, yeah, of course, I'm not in control. I think this is the toughest one, that we love control. As men, we can control everything. We don't need to. We can look at our phone and have sex. We can look at our phone and order food. We don't have to wait for anything. And it's different for women, and we'll talk about that. But uh, you're not in control. When you let go of control and start to live in liminal space, liminal space is I don't know what's next. I don't know how to get there. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I don't hear anything. That's probably the safest place that you can live. I choose to live in liminal space because I don't want to control anything. I want the Father to do what he's doing in my life. And number five, my favorite one, you are going to die. Listen, we have to go through patterns of life of dying to everything. Paul said, what, take up your cross daily, that he dies daily. Uh, I, what dying is, is that we die, we resurrect. We die, we resurrect, right? That's the pattern of life. We're born, we die, we resurrect. And so that first half of life, that, that boy in us, that child in us has to die. And uh, mine didn't come till later in life. Nobody ever told me these things. Nobody ever initiated me. Now I think at about age 30, Richard Rohr teaches, is a really good time to step into your second half of life. Um, most of us weren't told these things. So until my son died, literally in my 40s, did I not step into the suffering and allow it to transform me. And uh, I'm writing a whole book around that. But um, we have to die to ourselves. We have to die to not being in control. We have to die to that it's not all about us. We're just ordinary people. And then we're very limited without the, without the Father in our lives. We have to die to the fact that um, life is hard. And it's going to be hard. It doesn't change, right? Everything in my life, there's really, really good things. And there's really, really bad things. And sometimes they're really hard. I just went to Colorado this past week. My brother died. Two years ago, my sister died. Three years ago, my mom died. A few years, a couple years before that, my son died. And, and it's just one after the other after the other than watching my 81-year-old father and, and his pain uh, is something that I have to hold and I have to let it transform me and I have to let it become me instead of trying to anesthetize it and push it away. So life is hard. You're not that important. Your life is not about you. You're not in control and you're going to die. Our culture in America especially has done everything in its power, it seems, to move away from this ancient wisdom. Men are lured away to dominate through money, sex, power, consumerism, and they never really become men. The number one demonic principality spirit over America is comfortability. I believe it's a demonic principality over the nation of America. We've become so comfortable that we don't have to do anything. We were just in America. We were just with a bunch of people. And they literally, when they're talking about what things that they have to sacrifice, uh, it, it, it just inside it just makes me die because they're so comfortable and again this isn't criticism it's just the truth when you're you're in a fog when you live in America it's why we do the world race and get people out of America above the fog to hopefully initiate them and let them see for the first time it really is true I want you to get the book Adam's Return if you haven't read it yet promise me you'll go read it ask me questions about it let me just give you a couple of, of uh, quotes on the first and second half of life so Remember, and this is Carl Jung is the person who first wrote about this. 
A lot of people don't like him. He's got some things that are really off, but on this first and half, first half of life, second half of life stuff, he's spot on. And I encourage you to go figure this out and read some more into it and press into it. The first and second halves of life, it's when we begin to pay attention and to seek integrity precisely in the task within the task that we begin to move from the first to the second half of our own lives. The only thing strong enough to move you from the first half of life to the second is the faith is faith in the midst of suffering. The ability to bear darkness and uncertainty to carry the mystery of the paradox. Do you get that? The only way you step into second half of life is when you're not in control anymore and you can embrace darkness and you can embrace light the same way. When I get really bad, bad news, my brother died. I get to hold that. I don't get to get too emotional. Now, I can get emotional, I can get really sad, but I get to pull that back in and I get to go, okay, God, what are you doing, Father? What are you doing in this? What are you trying to teach me? What does my family need? And then when I get really good news, I get a good text and, I, and we're gonna go do something radical around the planet. I get to hold that the same. I don't get too emotional. I go, okay, God, this is awesome. Let's go do something. And usually it's never as good as it seems and it's never as bad as it seems. Remember that. It's really important in life. If you can face your mortality and let go of the small self early on, that little wound, that, that, that shadow self, that wounded boy inside of you, you'll experience heaven here and now, right? So we always say this, heaven's not the point. It's awesome that, that heaven's happening but it's not the point. The point is that we bring heaven to earth now. And you really can't do that in your life until you step into the second half because it's all about you somehow until then. When it's not about you anymore and you can bring heaven down to earth for everyone around you, it shifts everyone and everything around you. You make every heart look like the Garden of Eden. It's not what you do for God. I want you to really get this one. It's what God has done for you. You switch from trying to love God to just letting God love you. And it's at that point you actually fall in love with God. Let me say that again. The middle of that. You switch from trying to love God to just letting God love you. And then at that point you'll fall in love with God for the first time. In the second half of life, to start to understand that life is not only about doing, it's mostly about being. The advantage of those on the further journey and what I mean by the further journey, those that are pressing into this and really want to learn what it means to step into the second half of life, is that they can still remember and respect the first language and task. They have transcended, but also included all that went before. Everything belongs, guys. Listen, your sin, your weaknesses, your addictions, your holiness, your overcoming, uh, all of that, everything belongs. When you fail, please fail. It's the only time you learn anything. When you're successful, there's nothing to learn, right? So it's okay to fail. In fact, you're supposed to fail. And that belongs. And then when you succeed and it's going well, that belongs, but it doesn't matter, right? That the understanding. When you step into the second half, everything belongs and you use it and you learn from it. Father, why can't I get rid of my porn addiction? Instead of saying, why can't I get rid of it? Well, I say, Father, what are you trying to teach me in the midst of this so that I can be transformed so that I can transform others? See, transformed people transform people. Wounded people wound people. So if you just choose to be stuck in your addictions and you just say, well, that's it. That's just my life. You're going to stay there forever. But if you say, why is this addiction in my life? What's it trying to teach me? What I need to learn from this thing so that I can actually become transformed by it and it goes away and then I can help others walk into freedom. The reason God allows stuff in our lives is so that we can get other people free. You understand that? That's what second half of men and women think like. Amen? All right, we gotta practice. We must practice on drawing empty space. Okay, what do I mean by drawing empty space? I mean contemplation. I am terrible at it. I say it all the time, but I try to practice it every single day. Twice a day for 10 minutes, sitting with the Father, not talking, not praying in tongues, not asking him for things. He's not Santa Claus. He already knows what I'm going to ask. To be quite honest, I don't even know how to pray anymore. You know, I pray for my kids every day. I pray for my marriage every day. Your kingdom come, your will be done. I did a video on prayer and how you can pray for an hour without even thinking about it. Um, but mostly we just need to sit and contemplate. And we get a negative thought. Thomas Merton teaches great. 
Put that negative thought on a river in front of you. Just in your imagination, imagine that river. Take that negative thought, stick it on that river. And I have to just go and go until I just practice drawing on that empty space where I'm just with the Father. It's just me and Him. I think it's what Jesus did when He went to the lonely place. He detached from the pain, attached to the Father, so He could reattach to the pain. Right? And so there's a big difference between isolation and solitude. We've got to get to solitude and empty space. <clears throat> it's difficult to see why it is not yet manifest to imagine that there may be more to life when we're stuck in the first half of life with its concrete dualistic view of reality. And dualistic view, black and white, right and wrong. We're all, we all have, we're full of religion. We were all taught dispensationalism and all these false teachings. And so we get stuck in dualistic thinking. Is this right or is this wrong? Moralistic. Our Christianity has become about morals, some kind of game and task, instead of a relationship of empty and beauty and life and a triune dance. And that's the difference between first half. First half, Old Testament, right? I had to I would live by rules. My heart was wicked. I could never quite get there. I had to sacrifice and do all these things. New covenant, New Testament living. Prophet, priest, and king, my heart is clean. Hebrew says he washed my heart is perfect. I'm not born into sin. I'm born into beauty and life, right? And so I can struggle. Paul says, well, I, I do what I don't want to do, and I don't do what I do want to do, but man, thanks to God. And so we get to struggle. The whole point is the struggle. When Jesus says, uh, that's my mother and father, love them, honor them. Then he says, who are my mother and father, my brothers, my sisters? Isn't it all of you? It's that tension. He's always in that tension that we have to learn to live in and be okay with. That the tension is really good for us. That we don't have to complain. Everything is a privilege. Nothing is a sacrifice. Huge for second half of people to learn. First half don't know that. Second half do. This is a great quote. Oh, let me finish this. We, yet we can learn to see differently and to be present to being. This, simply practice, this simple practice shifts our visual, our usual way of literal seeing and invites us in an inner change in how we view ourselves, how we view the world and the divine. So I've got to shift everything in me by, stuck, by drawing on empty space. It helps me to shift the way I see myself. I can't love myself unless I know the Father loves me. So once I know the Father loves me and I was born to be loved, I can love myself really well. Therefore, I can love my neighbor really well. Right, and so we've got. We, this is a huge thing that second half of life people understand. It's not about me, so I don't have to worry about loving myself. I'm an ordinary man. When God comes, man, I turn into extraordinary. When He leaves, I'm limited, and I can sin and I can do all these things, right? But I, so I'm ordinary and I'm okay with that. That's a second half of life person. Listen to this quote by C. G. Jung: One cannot live in the afternoon of life according to the program of life's morning. For what was great in the morning will be of little importance in the evening. And what in the morning was true will at evening become a lie. <laughs> it was Carl Jung who first popularized the phrase, the two halves of life, <clears throat> to describe the two major tangents and tasks of human life. The first half of life is spent building our sense of identity, importance, and security. What, what we would call the false self and Freud might call the ego self. Jung emphasizes the importance and value of a healthy ego structure, but inevitably you discover often through failure or a significant loss, how I learned through Michael, that your conscious self is not at all is not all of you, but only the acceptable you. You will find your real purpose and identity at a much deeper level than the positive image you present to the rest of the world. In the second half of life, the ego still has a place but now in the service of the true self or soul, your inner and inherent identity. Your ego is the container that holds you all together. So now its strength is an advantage. Some, someone who can see their ego in this way is probably what we mean by a grounded person. Okay, so real quick. In my first half of life, my my late teens, my 20s, I'm building containers. I'm building that container of school. Man, if I can just graduate. And I graduate, I fill that container, I knock it over. It really didn't mean that much. Man, if I could just get that first girlfriend, or if I could just get married, that first boyfriend, and we get that, 
we kick that over because that container didn't really fulfill. I get my university, man. If I can just get that done, that first job, I climb that corporate ladder, right? We do all these containers and we find out when we get to the top of those that they really don't fulfill anything. And so we kick those over. And so what happens is the reason why one of the number one rates of suicide in America now are 50 year old men is because we live a life of transaction. We're transactional with our wives, our, our, our husbands. We're transactional with our children, our jobs. And literally, it's like Benjamin Franklin said, I'm, I'm dead at 40 and buried at 70 because I just die inside over and over and I'm not learning how to transcend and to, and to serve others and to make them better. I'm always about myself in my first half of life and I get stuck there. And I know a lot of 50, 60, 70 year olds, 80 year olds that are stuck in their first half of life because they've never allowed the pain of life to transform them. I know a lot of 60 some year old women who are just bitter and angry. Do you know anybody like that? Because they never allowed the, the, the suffering and the pain of life to become a part of them and learn from it and let it become who they are. Instead, they just get angry and they get bitter and they're mad at God and they're mad at everybody else. Mostly they're mad at themselves. All right, four initiations of a man. What it means to embrace, steward and release Four areas of every radically humble, successful man. You may have already seen something similar to this, but this has had a huge revelation on my family. So I trained my boys in this. And one of the mistakes I made is I mostly let them be initiated into warriors. So they were football players. I coached all four of my boys in football for, I think, 16 total years. They were rugby for my two older boys played um, collegiate rugby, played USA rugby, had full ride scholarships. And man, did they have warrior down. And we lived in Africa. That's where they learned rugby. And when we came back to America, I kind of left them in their, that warrior space. So they got in a lot of fights, uh, all kinds of things. Ultimately, Michael got into a lot of trouble with the cartel. I, that's ultimately what took his life violently. And so when you get stuck, like I said, in that one space, it, it's a killer. If you're just stuck in lover, it, 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 it doesn't work. So we've got to have all four of these, okay? <clears throat> If we do not know how to identify ourselves as real men, it's a tragedy. It is our responsibility as masters, as older men, to teach younger men what, what it really means to look like as a man. Most cultures that understand initiation, America does not, have only affirmed one of these ar archetypes, maybe two at the best. Our job today is difficult because we must affirm, educate, and validate all four archetypes and let them simmer and grow to, together to create a full man. We need enlightened and transformed warriors and lovers of life and beauty to produce truly big picture men or kings. So the warrior archetype must be named and rightly initiated or he will remain petty, violent, and unaccountable to self and society. If you don't work with it, it works against you. <clears throat> We have found warriors of the past, but rarely where they're truly initiated, like the Christian knights, were warriors that were brutalized, brutalized and corrupted by the Crusades and the European wars. During the Spanish and Roman Inquisitions, we totally destroyed any notion of the religious warrior. So in our history, we have created these warriors and we've left them to warrior. And the, you know even the Christian knights became corrupted uh, because they were just warriors, so they just started to kill. And, and and you leave a young man, like I said, a military man, to just warrior. I grew up in Colorado Springs around five military bases. The army guys who didn't know anything but warrior tried to fight us every weekend. And they still do because they just can't fight. The X Games, these guys pushing the limits, you know, jumping snowmobiles 300 feet through the air, just to, all the tattooing, everything. is. Men are trying to initiate themselves. Men know this is true inside of them. There's just no masters. There's no fathers to tell them that this is okay and it's true and we need to go further. First time I preached this 15 some years ago in a big mega church in Indiana, a big African man came running to the altar at the end and he had a huge scar on his chest and he was sobbing and sobbing and I was holding him. He was much bigger than me. And he said, I never knew my grandfather initiated me when I was little. My dad told me it was pathetic. And so I, I always discounted that my grandfather initiated, now I know I'm okay. He was in his 40s, right? We need to know as men that we can be initiated. Now, young ladies, I want you to get this. You are self-initiated. So women do not have to go through initiation rites. And, and now some do, I'll, I'll, uh, and I'll explain. But women cannot control their the menopause, their monthly cycle. 
know, you turn that certain age and you start to have that and you freak out and there's nothing that you can do about it. Uh, you can't control it. You just get to let it become a part of you. Uh, pregnancy and birth. You just get to let that baby grow inside of you. What a fearful, scary thing. If I always say if men had to do it, there'd be no more children. And uh, it's true. And so women just get to hold that baby and wait, knowing that pain's coming, knowing that major suffering's coming, the worst kind of pain in the world, right? It's coming, but they get to hold it and they get to own it anyway, and then they get to birth it. And so men don't have to do this. Men have nothing. We have nothing that we can't control. We, we, we're at, not at want for anything. Like I said, everything's at our fingertips. And so men can do anything they want. They're, they never have to be initiated. And so we sit on our couches and we play our video games and we have this extended adolescence. And I've got all these thousands, and I'll say it, thousands of beautiful, young, 30-year-old women who can't find a man. And I got a bunch of 28, 29, 30-year-old men that aren't even aware of these women because they've never been told they're men and how to become a man. And so they stay a little boy their whole lives. So let's just be honest. It is an epidemic, especially in the West. This is what we're here to do. Become masters and change this tide. We have abdicated our role of training the warrior, and now we end up with aimless soldiers that cannot control themselves. If we do not initiate the warrior part of a man, the dark warrior will always win, even by default or denial. The young male takes pride in being taught discipline, focus, respect, boundaries, and self-denial. Did you get that? Every young man takes pride in being taught those things. Discipline, focus, respect, boundaries, and self-denial. He knows he needs it, yet he also knows he has to be, it has to be forced upon him because he will seldom seek it out of it for himself. Most male initiations, right, have the boy do things like roll in ashes, cover himself in mud, dance aggressively with violent gestures, strip and expose himself to the elements and to pain, wear dung in his hair. The male has to enact, en enact in his aggressiveness and recognize how far it can lead him. He has to know the difference between good anger and rage. Okay, so all these other countries, all the world except America, have initiation rights for their young people. The Aborigines take their 12-year-olds. They take them out into the bush. They give them a club. The 12-year-old is by himself, has to kill a wild animal. He drags that animal into a circle that they've made. Everybody celebrates. They give him a bigger club, and he's invited to sit at the table. He's now a man who has a voice in the tribe. Uh, some Brazilians will climb up a tree naked, 100 feet, have to cover their nose because if the hornets sting their nose, they, they, they pass out and fall out of the tree and die. Hit a hornet's nest and sit and let the bees just sting them, hornets just sting them until they're done. And then you come down and you're initiated. There's a tribe, another tribe in Africa that's put their six-year-old sons outside of the village for a year to live by themselves. Now we're losing, and I can you can see all kinds of documentaries and stuff, the initiation rights, even in initiation rights in these countries because of Facebook and social media, people are just losing the point of why we do that. I think the Jews do a better job than the Christians with bar mitzvahs. I think that the uh, uh, Mormons send out their young men for two years to go live on their own and have to go door to door and face their fears. I think they do a great job. I don't think it's abuse. Uh, so, so as the church, the Christian church, we have not done anything with this. We've not initiated our young men. So therefore, we got all these beautiful women waiting to find a man and they can't find them. You don't believe me? Take a poll. Just take a survey. I have the conversation every week with another young, beautiful woman. I've got 19 people showing up today at G42 that I'm going to go start picking up. And most of them, 80% of them will be women and 80% of them can't find a man. It's the truth. <clears throat> I run into it all the time, young men, fatherless, wanting and waiting to be told. Look at these warriors, tell them to show their best self. The true spiritual teacher makes it safe for you to show your best self. He knows your best self will follow from your true self. Okay, so we got the warrior archetype. The second one is lover. Andrew Shearman taught me how to be the lover. He's in his C75 now. He's a poet. He, he quotes poetry, he quotes scripture. Uh, like no one else. He tells stories like no one else I know. Still, I've heard his stories now, all of them a hundred times each, and I still love it as every single time he tells them. 
Uh, he, he opens the door for, for Mo, his wife. He lays a coat down on the, on the ground as she needs to walk over water. He dances when her favorite song comes on. Uh, I have learned how to be the lover by watching his life. Lisa's favorite song, Eric Clapton. When it comes on, we dance. I know now to open the door for her. I know how to put my phone away and stop and just look into her eyes and listen and not think about what I'm going to say next. The lover learns how to just love life. A really good glass of wine with a really nice steak. Talking about the injustices of the world and, and, and teaching his children how to give their lives away to the third world, to third world countries and to orphans and to widows. And, but enjoying and embracing every single part of life. We need lovers, guys. We, need, we don't need these religious, ridiculous people who are always trying to make it about moralism and moralistic Christianity. We're all so full of religion, it's pathetic. We need to become more alive and more free. It's called freedom, not religion. Freedom from religion. Amen? <clears throat> it's strange that the West has largely created cultures of conspicuous consumerism when it took as its ultimate hero and God figure a poor, simple man. Why does most of the world consider the West to be greedy and materialistic? Why do we produce such a high rate of physically addicted people? Why is the search for affluence and pleasure our main concern? Could it be that we have not blessed the good side of joy and pleasure? It's okay to lust after life. It's okay to, to do those things as long as you're doing it in the midst of this archetype and living for others. It's a tough one to learn, I know, because your religious spirit's going off right now. Now it comes back and bites us from behind. When I consciously seek a certain amount of creature, creature comfort in my life, I find that it satisfies me and also will never satisfy me. That is the very life-giving and creative tension to live in, what we were talking about. We go to the outer world as Western Christians for our daily pleasures, but we seldom allow them to bring us to God or even to ourselves. We remain split and always feeling guilty. Flesh is bad and spirit is good in our terrible dualism. Yet the Christian religion is supposed to be incarnation, a love affair between flesh and spirit. It really is quite strange. Hebrews 4.12 has been misquoted and mis your, to get rid of your flesh and separate and that sword and all that it means is actually a sword that goes in and brings them all together. Everything belongs. You're not evil. You're not horrible. You were born into love. You were born in, into freedom and beauty and, and the love of life, the lusts of life. We just taught you wrong. I'm sorry. Ours is the only religion in the world that dares to believe that God became flesh. Christianity says that God is love, but does not appear to really enjoy the lover. We still make our religion into a moralistic matter instead of a mystical joy. Like Micah, the daughter of Saul, she despised David for dancing half naked, or he was totally naked, in the church. We look away from the freedom. Religion is not a proper and dignified thing. It is a love affair. Moralism keep, keeps us making lists for God instead of making love to God. I know that's hard for you. I know it was hard for me for the first 10 years I was studying this stuff. Moralism keeps us making lists for God instead of making love to God. The most loving man, the most generous to society and to life are usually men who have a lusty sense of life, beauty, pleasure, and sex but they have a very realistic expectation of every one of them. The man who took me recently to a four-star restaurant with his elegant wife, while speaking excitedly of the food making love to him, is the same man who talks passionately about refugees, injustice, and third world issues. And he has passed these passions, these passionate concerns on to his natural and spiritual children. He is the lover that I am talking about. Number three is sage, but if you wish to know how things come about, desire not understanding, ask for grace, not instruction, the groaning of prayer, not diligent reading, the spouse, not the teacher, God, not man, darkness, not clarity, not light, but the fire. That's St. Boniface, the soul's journey to God. The wise man, is the, uh, the sage is the wise man. The sage is the C.S. the C.S. Lewis's of the world, Thomas Aquinas, uh, Kyle Reiner, all these 
men, JR Token, that that just that, that learned that being that sage, just learning and 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 meditating on the scripture and meditating and learning and writing and creating poetry and that sage is always being built. So that warrior is man. I I the, how is Jesus a warrior? He confronted leprosy all the time. He confronted demons and cast them out all the time. I'm the warrior. I confront the injustices of the world. The lover, man, I just love life. I love being married. I love my child. I love my ministry. I love everything that I'm doing. And I find that love in each thing. And I enjoy the lusts of life. And I know how to manage those. And then I'm the sage, man. I'm, I'm studying. I'm making myself better. Don't go to Bible college, please. It'll kill you. If you're, if you're thinking about school, if you're 18 or older, go to Global U and learn what entrepreneurism and freedom looks like. Uh, most of my young people who go to Bible seminaries get stuck in that dualistic thinking and get stuck that they know more than everyone else. It's the most dangerous thing you could ever do. You don't know more. In fact, the older you get, the less that you know. So you can become that sage. Amen. The uninitiated man, uh, the sage or wise man archetype is the man who integrates his left brain knowledge into the bigger and often non-rational realm of wisdom. They are not satisfied with being technicians or mere academics. The uninitiated man stops with the accumulation of facts and information. He does discipline it, the warrior, tastes it, the lover, or integrate it with the big picture, the king. Without this, these, he becomes an arrogant peasant, a narrow specialist, a withdrawn dreamer, an office bureaucrat. Those are the Spanish bells in the background. Enjoy them. Listen. If we do not both validate and then challenge the life of the mind, we cannot create the sage or the wise man. The process is called contemplation or meditation. We've talked about it. You have to be spiritual to be a true wise man. Francis of Assisi told us that we could do any work or study as long as it did not extinguish the spirit of prayer and devotion, which always had to come first. You can be brilliant and faith-filled at the same time. The true sage has a balance between knowing and not knowing, between intelligence and not needing to be intelligent, between darkness and light. The wise man knows what he does not know. Victor, Victor Frankl says, sell your cleverness and purchase bewilderment instead. It is such willingness to live with the bewilderment that characterizes the true wise man. Amen. And then the king, the last one. When dad entered the room, the whole world made sense. Man, I want you to get this. I'm striving. When my hair is grayer and I'm older and I'm in my 60s and 70s, man, I want nothing but to be serving the next generation, seeing them become fully who they are. All four types of these men. And, and again, John Eldridge teaches this a little bit de deeper. I wouldn't say deeper. He teaches it different. He has the cowboy and some different elements. I think Richard Rohr goes much deeper than what John Eldridge does. But if you want an introduction, go go read John Eldridge's book uh, on the archetypes. It's, it's, it's awesome. It's powerful. When dad entered the room, the whole world made sense. The king is the integration and recapulation of all the other three, warrior, sage, and lover. He holds them all together in a grand display of balance and wholeness. He is the master of all power, so much so that he can risk looking powerless. I don't need to know anymore. It's okay to not know. For the king archetype, we have great, great examples. Uh, king Edward of England, Stephen of Hungary, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela. These men did not avoid power, but owned it, integrated, integrated it, and used it for the common good. Unfortunately, we know that they are the exception in history and of course, most kings are not heads of state at all. We created a sacred rite for the consecration of kings to tell them they must be holy, but we must admit that it seldom worked. Most of them seem to have handled power and mercy very poorly, being either dark kings or warriors. It took King David a while to become a king, but he is the symbolic whole man of Judaism, just as Jesus is the king of kings and the whole man for Christians. Such kingship might be rare, but we must still name it and present it. It is the ultimate male goal and final and full integration of the sacred. We need good leaders, yet a king is not just a leader. He is not just a father. He is our contact with the holy and with the universal. 
Oof. I hope this is hitting your spirit. The kingly part of a man connects heaven and earth, spiritual and material, divine and human. When you meet a man that seems a bit larger than life, you know he has some king energy. He is a grandfather. A young prince needs some models along the way to become a king. If he meets some good, passionate lovers, great wise men, and fully alive warriors, he will be well prepared to hold together the whole human realm. He will be a king, even if he's just a king of his limited area of competence. You can be a, listen, I love this. You can be a king of a cobbler shop, believe it or not. And people will come to your court, not so much to have you fix their shoes, as to have you fix their souls. And they will not even know that is why they came. So far in my life, I've only met a couple of men that I could truly say have become kings. Men who are willing to father, who manage the other three archetypes in a mesmerizing way, and knowing life is not about them, but about their spiritual sons and daughters. My goal in life is to become that king. And I want you to pray for me to do that. <clears throat> and I want you to pray for yourself to become. If you have any questions on this, I want you to pray on this. I want you to sit in this. I want you to get the book. I want you to read it. I want you to, 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 to learn. If you're a young man, I want you to start making it a goal every day to learn how to become a better warrior, how to become a better sage, how to become that lover. That one day you'll be able to become that master that allows other people to get the impartation from you to become a master themselves. That's the whole goal. Guys, we are in trouble as society. Our society is fatherless. It's broken. We have a lot of young men stuck in adolescence. Uh, I'm reading a great book called The Coddling of the American Mind. Our universities are doing it to our minds. Uh, a bro these broken systems. The church is a broken system. Our universities are a broken system. And we have answers. We have some, some new ways of doing these things. We just need to kind of awaken the world to what they need to do. So I hope you enjoy this. If you have any questions, uh, Gary at theblacktribe.com, uh, Gary and Lisa Black.com. Make sure you're listening to our podcast on the heart. Uh, series four just came out. Um, it's an eight series. It's eight set in there. You've got to learn how to live from your heart. If you want to learn how to step into the second half, uh, a lot deeper and uh, a cooler dive on that stuff. Hey, God bless you. Have any questions, please let me know. And I'm glad to send you uh, any of these written notes and material. So just let me know. Hey, have a, have a great day. Bye.